All right, so I'm going to uh, talk about uh, what's new in Lumbar TDR, if uh, the man in the glass booth there can help me get the slides up. Great. So, um, you know, what happened while we were all sleeping for the last couple of years and uh, going through a pandemic. So here's, uh, here's where we go. So everybody kind of remembers where they were on September 11, 2001. Um, but uh, three weeks later, uh, that's where I was on October 3rd, 2001. That's when we started the Protest IDE study. It was kind of a little sobering time in our country, if you remember, and an interesting time to be uh, flying around the country at the different sites. The airports were, were still pretty empty. But that's how long it was. So Protest just had its birthday uh, three weeks ago, earlier this month. It's been 20 years um, since we've been uh, implanting that device. And um, Terry Marnay uh, was there as part of the team. And that was, whoops, that was Terry. This is uh, I'm going to have to use my button here, but that was Terry in the middle of it. And, you know, as experienced surgeons know, it's really nice with a new technique to have an experienced surgeon there. And sometimes just changing the angle a little bit, you know, makes uh, what would have been okay into something perfect. And, uh, you know, it's a very good mentoring way to do it. Although, again, we were all at the beginning of our learning curve, and, and all the patients in the IDE study were the beginning of every surgeon's learning curve. So, in a way, the IDE data, although really good and, and aging beautifully, represents the, a worst case scenario, much worse. Than, than today where we're training surgeons uh, by surgeons based on, on experience. So what, what's the status of the lumbar TDRs in the US? Well, there are still only two uh, uh, lumbar disc replacements that are commercially available. Uh, it's ProDiscal and ActiveL. Um, ProDiscal was uh, approved uh, for two levels in uh, early 2020, and so that's the only two-level approval. Uh, there is nothing new that has entered the lumbar arthroplasty pipeline for more than 10 years. So that means uh, the Freedom Disc, by the way, is still kind of hanging around in limbo. That has completed um, its IDE. Uh, the, it's been reacquired. There are some um, uh, kind of unsavory uh, components to the uh, management of the, the new company. Um, so I, it's unlikely or uncertain at, at the best whether that will ever see the light of day. But even if it means that if somebody came up with a great idea on Monday and went to the <laughs> FDA and said, I've got this new device, it would still be you know five to six year process before it's or the commercial light of day. So uh, the two discs that we have commercially available today are likely going to be the ones that we will have available uh, for the next at least five or six years, if not longer. Um, there were other discs that completed uh, the FDA process, but uh, never uh, were commercially sold in the U.S. Flexicore was a disc that was a metal metal disc with a hard stop, acquired by Stryker, Stryker and withdrawn before it ever went to FDA panel. Uh, the, the Maverick disc was a Medtronic disc that was metal metal. Uh, uh, with a keel, and that had some licensing issues, so it was never commercially sold in the U.S. They did sell it outside the U.S. Uh, for several years, and I'm, I'm not even sure that it's still available globally, but data was collected, and five-year data was published on uh, the Maverick. The Freedom Disc uh, was the disc I showed you that's kind of in limbo. No data has been published on that disc at all. And the Kineflex was a metal, metal uh, disc uh, that had both cervical and lumbar disc IDEs that ran concurrently went all the way up to the eve of panel, uh, but was uh, just a victim of the metal metal uh, hip replacement um, discussion that was happening in the lay press, and, and the FDA uh, was uncomfortable approving metal metal implants. And Kineflex was reborn with different materials as the simplified disc, but unfortunately had to start a whole new IDE study. But that is now FDA approved. So those were the discs through uh, through the FDA. There are discs outside the U.S. that have not come through an FDA process. The ESP is a viscoelastic disc uh, that's in use. The Mobi uh, L, uh, I'm sorry, the M6L, very similar uh, to the um, M6 cervical is in use in other countries. Uh, Mobi similarly has a, a lumbar disc that's used outside the U.S. Bagheera, a cervical disc that, as Armin showed us, is going to start an FDA study, has a lumbar disc that's in use uh, outside the U.S. And there are a couple of discs that have not um, even survived outside the U.S. Uh, under the old uh, European system uh, where they just had to prove initial engineering um, and safety and it was really whether efficacy was proved by the marketplace. But the Europeans are now changing more to an FDA model uh, and making it more difficult to get devices through. Uh, there was a lateral disc called the Triumph disc that started uh, a pilot trial for lateral studies in 2010 and never persisted. 
Uh, there, it was a lateral disc that was uh, pioneered by Luis Pimenta, who was the, the champion for x -Lift. So if anybody knows how to put a lateral implant in, it was uh, Luis Pimenta. Um, and they had a lot of problems uh, with this disc. You hear a, publish a publication showing fairly long-term follow-up, um, but showed, uh, whoops, did I just go dark? Yeah, you want to go? Sure. Um, there were quite a bit of uh, device removals, a lot of adjacent segment HO um, uh, migration. There was HO particularly on the opposite side uh, where uh, the implant was pounded across the, the, the contralateral uh, lateral annulus. Um, so that disc uh, obviously didn't do well. There's a disc that's, that's being tested offshore based on uh, a really a T-lift kind of approach. It's uh, uh, T-lifts with a little bit of a motion segment, but it requires a huge amount of posterior decompression in order to get in, just like doing a T-lift. So, um, you know, this disc is, um, uh, may or may not uh, survive, although it's, it's being studied and uh, put in uh, outside the U.S. Um, big uh, revision surgery numbers in the single publication from 2021, showing 46% of the uh, implants had to be revised versus 30% of the T-lifts that they were uh, controlled to. So uh, probably not a very encouraging um, looking disc uh, so far. Um, but it just it highlights how strong our IDE data is and the things that we were able to harvest from the big pool of IDE data. I mean, one of the most fun and I think um, uh, rewarding papers that we published was looking at adjacent segment uh, radiographic degeneration because we had the data of the ProDisc L patients for five years. We had their pre-op x-rays and we had their five-year x-rays and we just asked independent radiologists to look at those digital films, score the discs above and below and tell us in the control group who had fusions and an investigational group who had artificial discs who had more degeneration from baseline um, at five years. So these were the numbers we found that in all patients, the ones who worsened at five years above a fusion, 28.6% of those 100 patients. Only 9.2% of the 200 patients who had randomized to an artificial disc. And again, this is not surgeon bias or any, anybody else. It's just the radiologist using a scoring system. That difference is three to one. That is highly statistical statistically significant. So all other things being equal, there's a significantly less radiographic degeneration. We were able to find this, the little subculture of patients who had absolutely pristine adjacent levels. So we said, what about that patient? You pull out that subgroup. Well, of the patients who randomized to fusion, 23.8% now had some degenerative change on their x-rays. Um, but the ones who randomized to an artificial disc was only 6.7%. Also greater than the three to one difference, more highly statistically significant. So uh, the only variable between those two groups was what they randomized to. And again, the, the objective here was to get arm's length uh, interpretation. We went one level further with the active L data. We used the same scoring system, but since that was a disc to disc trial, not a disc to fusion, um, we weren't asking it to compare to fusions. We just said now, compare it to the amount of of range of motion that that segment had at five years. And here we're able to show that um, basically for every degree of motion that the surgeon was able to put into that segment five years later, there was a proportionate decrease in the percent of patients who had adjacent segment worsening. So, uh, you know, again, reinforcing what we all wished is that there is a protective effect of motion on adjacent segment degeneration. So if we did a crappy job, we were basically fusing them, like, you know, 10 or 11%. But if we did a really good job and had, you know, more than uh, uh, six degrees of motion, none of them showed adjacent segment degeneration. Pretty neat stuff. There's enough data floating around that um, you can search for multi-center prospective randomized controlled trials of discs versus fusion with five-year follow-up. And we found four of them and did a meta-analysis. Three of them were uh, from FDA studies. You can see it's the Maverick study, the Charité study, the Protus study. The third one down was an OUS study. It was in Sweden, Scandinavia, where they can control their patient populations. And they just decided nationally, let's do an IDE-like study where they pick patients, they randomize them to an artificial disc or a fusion and follow them out for five years. So now you can take this data and statistically, it's similar enough that you can pool it and you can apply stricter statistics to it than you can in an individual prospect or randomized study. But now you're talking about a lot of patients, a lot of patients all over the world, a lot of surgeons, a lot of sites, um, and pooling this data. So you want to know in which group, in the orthoplasty or the fusion patients, uh, did they have better success in their ODI? 
well, it was significantly more in the arthroplasty patients in these huge groups of patients. How about reoperation rate? Well, you know, t uh, your gut would tell you the artificial disc patients must have more reoperations. They have half as many reoperations as p the patients who randomized the fusion. That risk ratio is almost 0.5. So, in five years later, this huge pool of global patients only had half as many who needed a reoperation. And how about VAS score for back pain? Again, the main indication for doing this. Um, numeric very strongly in favor of the artificial disc patients five years later reporting less back pain than fusion patients. So here's a huge, huge amounts of data that we collected in a very scientific way that we can look at in an even more scientific way um, and learn from it. Long-term stuff is coming out of uh, uh, Europe and uh, Australia outside the US. I'll show you some papers that were published in the last couple of years. This was a, a French study um, of the ESP, that viscoelastic disc that I showed you, an observational cohort, 61 patients at five years, showing maintained range of motion with a 8% uh, reoperation rate. Um, in a study from, uh, and this is um, uh, a little bit, uh, this is uh, Matt yeah, Scott Youngs. I'm, I'm not sure if Matt is on yet, but uh, Matt will be talking to us. But um, Matt is a very busy clinician who is a rigorous scientist also. Matt is really good about collecting all of his data and analyzing it. So here are 122 patients with long-term follow-up, statistically significant improvements in his pain and ODI scores, and 92% good or excellent uh, uh, satisfaction at their final review. Uh, one more study out of Italy uh, showing 30 patients with a mean follow-up of 164 months. That's, that's a lot of years. Significant improvement in VAS and ODI. No significant difference after uh, year one, all the way out to 10, 10 to 14 years. Um, and the final follow-up at that long term showed 70% of the implants were still moving. So we, we kind of keep seeing the same pattern, whether it's here in the US or even outside the US uh, without the FDA controls. So what's the really new stuff that happened in the last year or so? And I'll, I'll show you the ICES policy statement, ActiveL seven-year outcomes were published. Um, Karen butner Jans, who is a pioneer who developed the Charité, um, published a meta-analysis, and Terry Marnay presented his long-term follow-ups at NAS. So this was the, the the um, ISS policy statement, which was based on the literature, really just analyzing the literature and made a statement coming from a spine society that says, based on the review of, of evidence-based literature, this organization strongly supports both cervical and lumbar arthroplasty, including multi-level use as approved by the FDA as safe and effective treatment alternatives to fusion. I think a re very reasonable statement um, that we couldn't get out of some of the other organizations that, that many of us belong to and some of us don't belong to anymore because they wouldn't do this stuff. Because insurance companies look to these kind of statements when they're deciding whether they're going to uh, cover uh, arthroplasty. Um, this is the uh, ActiveL seven-year data. Um, and it shows uh, the hockey stick is very stable, uh, just as uh, Armin showed us in cervical. It's rewarding. We don't see a tail up. We don't see these patients getting worse. And these are the original IDE patients um, uh, examined with the same parameters that were used at all the other data points. And uh, this is Karen Butenrounds. This is her uh, uh, meta-analysis six prospective randomized studies, a minimum two-year follow-up. And her uh, uh, summary was that the TDR is the most appropriate surgical technique for treating a degenerative disc disease, followed by an ALEF. And uh, we have like another problem. It looks like. Let's see if I can get us out of here. Uh, probably not. All right, so we're close to the close. So the, the last couple of slides were just basically saying that, uh, you know, we're, we're lucky that we have all this data um, and we see it continuing to age nicely um, by time, but also have a very, very large global footprint and uh, the, the outcomes always come out the same. So it's not like we're unique and somebody else is not. So um, thank you. And uh, does anybody have any questions about that stuff? Otherwise, uh, Armin, I think you need to get next door, and uh, we're going to do uh, two levels. Yeah. I want to ask you a question. Um, I've never seen the data that you presented about preserving range of motion related to adjacent level. Okay, so I want to ask you this question. Would you, you know, would you say that, hey, possibly the artificial disc, if you're putting in a collapsed disc that didn't have much motion, and the fact that you're actually restoring motion, um, would you go as far as saying that maybe it actually helps the adjacent level? I'd like to see what you think about that. 
Um, you mean versus, yeah, if you had a, a segment that's basically fused, whether it's been surgically fused or has no motion in it, well, then you'd expect it to have a worse outcome, just like in the, the study where they had a fusion. My question is that when you're putting artificial discs, typically we're not putting lumbar discs in patients that are, you know, have a high disc, right? Many of these have already collapsed. They have some modic changes. So in those cases where you're remobilizing the disc and putting an artificial disc, I would imagine that at the index level, you are gaining motion Correct. over what he has naturally, what she has naturally. So do you think that that would possibly even have a protective effect of the adjacent level versus if you just left the patient with a degenerative disc? That's kind of my question. So would the degenerative disc act like a fusion, like the, the, the surgical fusions and predispose the, the next level to more degeneration is what you're saying? Well, I'm kind of saying this. If, if you took a group of patient population and left one untreated, they have a degenerative disc, they have back pain, you're not going to treat them. Okay. And you took that same group and you had another cohort that you actually placed an artificial disc in that disc degeneration. Yeah, I mean, and if you look five years down, what does the adjacent level look like in both of those groups? That's, that's my yeah, question. Yeah, I mean, that would require uh, a, you know, a different kind of study, but it would be a great study because then you could actually prove that you really should encourage people to have an intervention versus not. So I don't know the answer to that other than you know, my gut feeling is it, it should, but we don't have that, that information. It would be a nice little prospective study. Uh, Dr. Ziegler? Yes. I just wanted to ask you a quick question, kind of in the same vein with that. Uh, you know, one of the conversations I find myself having with patients a lot, you know, I tell them about this 3X kind of difference in radiographic findings at five years between disc replacement and fusion. And, but to what, you know, you were just mentioning, people that have this almost auto fusion, totally collapsed level, I always tell them that in my head, for those patients that I'm fusing, it kind of makes sense for me to think that I'm not necessarily increasing their adjacent segment disease risk if they're already not displaying any motion at that level and I'm going to be fusing it. I'm careful to tell them I don't have any data to back that up, but uh, how do you, I guess, talk to patients about that in terms of the ones that you're going to be fusing for whatever reason and, and their adjacent segment disease uh, in regard to their pre-op imaging and motion? Yeah, it's a great point, John. And, uh, you know, you just have to... Uh, always have that conversation with them. We know the outcomes aren't that different, that the biggest change in outcome is really the uh, uh, reoperation rate over time. But there are some people who anatomically have to have a fusion. They're either uh, too collapsed, too much uh, bony um, osteophyte, or they're unstable. You know, they have a pars defect or a degen uh, spondy, or they have too much facet disease. So, uh, you know, some people have to have a fusion um, and they're disappointed in it. So then you have to kind of pivot a little bit and just tell them, as you you do that there's nothing wrong with a fusion um, it's just that for you that is the right operation